it's loading. Hey, what's up, YouTube? What's up, Twitter? So basically, um, I'm going to be recording Chapter 9 of Women Race in Class by Angela Y. Davis as an audiobook that I'll be posting on YouTube as well as my RSS feed where my podcast is. You can get that on you, on uh, on Apple iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and like Stitcher, and a bunch of like all over the place. If you search Lil Guillotine Podcast, you'll be able to listen to this audiobook. Uh, so this audiobook doesn't exist anywhere as far as I'm aware, so that's why I'm recording it. We're going to be doing a a uh, study group this Sunday at 4.30 p.m. at the Social Justice Center in Madison, Wisconsin. So come by and let's talk about this uh, this um, critical intersectional feminist black liberation theory that I'm reading by Angela Davis, if you can. So yeah, the announcements were that I'm going to be tomorrow, I'm going to be giving a, a talk at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at Union South at 4.30. First time I'll be paid an honorarium for giving a talk at the university, so that's exciting. And on Thursday at 9.30 a.m., we're going to be meeting with Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee out of Milwaukee at Taco Bell on East Washington Avenue in Madison, Wisconsin. If you're in Madison, we're going to go put pressure on the Department of Corrections to uh, have some transparency in their committee on inmate and youth deaths. Basically, come, sh you know, come show up if you're interested in trying to help possibly curb the deaths that happen in prisons here in Wisconsin. So without further ado, I'm going to get into it, recording this audiobook, so folks can uh, read it instead of having to, I'm sorry, listen to it instead of having to read it for the study group. Uh, some really good theory, second time I've read and done a study group on this book. So yeah, I'm going to be editing live, so if I make a mistake, I'm going to stop and then uh, rewind the recording software so that I don't have to edit it when I'm done. So if I stop, that's uh, what I'm doing. So without further ado... Here we go. Women, Race, and Class by Angela Y. Davis. Chapter 9. Working Women, Black Women, and the History of the Suffrage Movement. In January 1868, when Susan B. Anthony published the first issue of Revolution, working women whose ranks in the labor force had recently expanded had begun to defend their rights conspicuously. During the Civil War, more white women than ever before had gone to work outside their homes. In 1870, while 70% of women workers were domestics, one-fourth of all non-farm workers in general were female. Within the garment industry, they had already become the majority. At this time, the labor movement was a rapidly expanding economic force, comprising no less than 30 nationally organized unions. Inside the labor movement, however, the influence of male supremacy was so powerful that only the cigar makers and printers had opened their doors to women. But some women workers had attempted to organize themselves. During the Civil War and its immediate aftermath, the sewing women constituted the largest group of women working outside their homes. When they began to organize, the spirit of unionization spread from New York to Boston and Philadelphia and to all the major cities where the garment industry flourished. When the National Labor Union was founded in 1866, its delegates were compelled to acknowledge the sewing women's efforts. As the initiative of William Silvis, the convention resolved to support not only the daughters of toil in the land, as the sewing women were called, but the general unionization of women and their full equality with respect to wages. When the National Labor Union reconvened in 1868, electing Silvis as their president, the presence of several women among the delegates, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, compelled the convention to pass stronger resolutions and generally treat the cause of working women's rights with greater seriousness than before. Women were welcomed at the 1869 founding convention of the National Colored Labor Union. As the black workers explained in one resolution, they did not want to commit to the mistakes heretofore made by our white fellow citizens in omitting women. 
this black labor organization, created because of the exclusionary policies of white labor groups, proved by its practice to be more seriously committed to working women's rights than its white counterpart and predecessor. While the NLU had simply passed resolutions supporting women's equality, the NCLU actually elected a woman, Mary S. Carey, to serve on the organization's policy-making executive committee. Suzadi B. Anthon, <clears throat> see, okay, so I did a, t I did a mistake there, but that's because there was a typo. They said, it said Suzadi B. Anthony. And it's obviously not Suzadi. So yeah, I'm gonna go back. Boom, here we go. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Caddy Stanton did not record any acknowledgement of the black labor organization's anti-sexist accomplishments. They were probably too absorbed in the suffrage battle to take note of that important development. In the first issue of Anthony's Revolution, the newspaper financed by the racist Democrat George Francis Train, the overall message was that women should seek the ballot. Once the reality of women's suffrage was established, so the paper seemed to say it would be the millennium for women, with the final triumph of morality for the nation as a whole. We shall show that the ballot will secure for women equal place and equal wages in the world of work, that it will open to her the schools, colleges, professions, and all the opportunities and advantages of life, that in her hand it will be a moral power to stay the tide of crime and misery on every side. Though its vision was often too narrowly focused on the ballot, revolution played an important role in the struggles of working women during the two years it was published. The demand for the eight-hour day was repeatedly raised within the pages of the paper, as was the anti-sexist slogan, Equal Pay for Equal Work. From 1868 to 1870, working women, especially in New York, could rely upon revolution to publicize their grievances as well as their strikes, their strategies, and their goals. Anthony's involvement in women's labor struggles of the post-war period was not restricted to journalistic solidarity. During the first year of her paper's publication, she and Stanton used the revolution's offices to organize printers into the Working Women's Association. Shortly thereafter, the national typographers became the second union to admit women, and in the revolution's offices, the Women's Typographical Union, Local Number 1, was established. Thanks to Susan B. Anthony's initiative, a second Working Women's Association was later organized among the sewing women. Although Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, and their colleagues on the paper made important contributions to the cause of working women, they never really accepted the principle of trade unionism. As they had been previously unwilling to concede that black liberation might claim momentary priority over their own interests as white women, they did not fully embrace the fundamental principles of unity and class solidarity, without which the labor movement would remain powerless. In the eyes of the suffragists, woman was the ultimate test. If the cause of women could be furthered, it was not wrong for the women to function as scabs when male workers in their trade were on strike. Susan B. Anthony was excluded from the 1869 convention of the National Labor Union because she had urged women printers to go work as scabs. In defending herself at this convention, Anthony proclaimed that men have great wrongs in the world between the existence of labor and capital, but these wrongs as compared to the wrongs of women in whose faces the doors of the trades and vocations are slammed shut are not as a grain of sand on the seashore. Anthony's and Stanton's postures during this episode were astonishingly similar to the suffragists' anti-black position within the Equal Rights Association. 
as Anthony and Stanton attacked black men when they realized that the ex-slaves might receive the vote before white women, so they lashed out in a parallel fashion against the men of the working class. Stanton, okay, I have to, I'm sorry, I hit the mic. Against the middle of the class. And it made a big bumping sound, so here we go. Against the men of the working class, Stanton insisted that the exclusion from the NLU proved what the revolution has said again and again, that the worst enemies of women's suffrage will ever be the laboring classes of men. Woman was the test, but not every woman seemed to qualify. Black women, of course, were virtually invisible within the protracted campaign for women's suffrage. As for white working-class women, the suffrage leaders were probably impressed at first by the organizing efforts and militancy of their working-class sisters. But as it turned out, the working women themselves did not enthusiastically embrace the cause of women's suffrage. Although Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton persuaded several female labor leaders to protest the disenfranchisement of women, the masses of working women were far too concerned about their immediate problems, wages, hours, working conditions, to fight for a cause that seemed terribly abstract. According to Anthony, the great distinctive advantage possessed by the working men of this republic is that the son of the humblest citizen, black or white, has equal chances with the son of the richest in the land. Susan B. Anthony would never have made such a statement if she had familiarized herself with the realities of working class families. As working women knew all too well, their fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons who exercised the right to vote continued to be miserably exploited by their wealthy employers. Political equality did not open the door to economic equality. Woman wants bread, not the ballot, was the title of a speech Susan B. Anthony frequently delivered as she sought to recruit more working women into the fight for suffrage. As the title indicates, she was critical of the working women's tendency to focus on their immediate needs. But they naturally sought tangible solutions to their immediate economic problems, and they were seldom moved by the suffragists' promise that the vote would permit them to become equal to their men, their exploited suffering men. Even the members of the Working Women's Association, organized by Anthony in the offices of her newspaper, elected to refrain from fighting for suffrage. Miss Stanton was anxious to have a Working Women's Suffrage Association, explained the first vice president of the Working Women's Association. It was left to a vote and ruled out. The society at one time comprised over 100 working women but as there was nothing practical done to ameliorate their condition, they gradually withdrew. Early in her career as a women's rights leader, Susan B. Anthony concluded that the ballot contained the real secret of women's emancipation and that sexism itself was far more oppressive than class inequality and racism. In Anthony's eyes, the most odious oligarchy ever established on the face of the globe was the rule of men over women. An oligarchy of wealth, where the rich govern the poor. An oligarchy of learning, where the educated govern the ignorant. Or even an oligarchy of race, where the Saxon rules the African, might be endured. But this oligarchy of sex, which makes father, brothers, Husbands, sons, the oligarchs over the mothers and sisters, the wife and daughters of every household, which ordains all men sovereigns, all women subjects, carries discord and rebellion into every home of the nation. Anthony's staunchly feminist position was also a staunch reflection of bourgeois ideology. 
and it was probably because of this ideology's blinding powers that she failed to realize that working class women and black women alike were fundamentally linked to their men by the class exploitation and racist oppression which did not discriminate between the sexes. While their men's sexist behavior definitely needed to be challenged, the real enemy, their common enemy, was the boss, the capitalists, or whoever was responsible for the miserable wages and unbearable working conditions and for racist and sexist discrimination on the job. Working women did not raise the banner of suffrage en masse until the early 20th century, when their own struggles forged special reasons for demanding the right to vote. When women struck the New York garment industry in the renowned uprising of the 20,000, during the winter of 1909-1910, the ballot began to acquire a special relevance to working women's struggles. As women labor leaders began to argue, working women could use the vote to demand better wages and improved conditions on the job. Women's suffrage could serve as a powerful weapon of class struggle. After the tragic fire at the New York Triangle Shirtwaist Company claimed the lives of 146 women, the need for legislation prohibiting the hazardous conditions of women's work became dramatically obvious. In other words, working women needed the ballot in order to guarantee their very survival. The Women's Trade Union League urged the creation of wage earners suffrage leagues. The leading member of the New York Suffrage League, Leonora O'Reilly, developed a powerful working class defense of women's right to vote. Aiming her argument at the anti-suffrage politicians, she also questioned the legitimacy of the prevailing cult of motherhood. You may tell us that our place is in the home. There are eight million of us in these United States who must go out of it to earn our daily bread, and we come to tell you that while we are working in the mills, the mines, the factories, and the mercantile houses, we have not the protection that we should have. You have been making laws for us, and the laws you have made have not been good for us. Year after year, working women have gone to the legislature in every state and have tried to tell the story of their need. Now, so Leonora O'Reilly and her working class sisters proclaimed, they were going to fight for the ballot. And indeed, they would use it as a weapon to remove all those legislatures from office whose loyalties were with big business. Working class women demanded the right to suffrage as an arm to assist them in the ongoing class struggle. This new perspective within the campaign for women's suffrage bore witness to the rising influence of the socialist movement. Indeed, women socialists brought a new energy into the suffrage movement and defended the vision of struggle born of the experiences of their working class sisters. Of the 8 million women in the labor force during the first decade of the 20th century, more than 2 million were black. As women who suffered the combined disabilities of sex, class, and race, they possessed a powerful argument for the right to vote. But racism ran so deep within the women's suffrage movement that the doors were never really opened to black women. The exclusionary policies of the NAWSA did not entirely deter black women from raising the demand for the vote. Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and Mary McLeod Bethune were among the most well-known black suffragists. Margaret Murray Washington, who was a leading figure of the National Association of Colored Women, confessed that, personally, women's suffrage has never kept me awake at night. This casual indifference may well have been a reaction to the racist stance of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. For Washington also argued that 
colored women quite as much as colored men realize that if there is ever to be equal justice and fair play in the protection in the courts everywhere for all races, then there must be an equal chance for women as well as men to express their preference through the votes. As Washington points out, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs established a suffrage department to impart to its members knowledge about governmental affairs so that women may be prepared to handle the vote intelligently and wisely. The entire black women's club movement was imbued with the spirit of women's suffrage, and despite the rejection they received from the NAWSA, they continued to defend women's right to vote. When the Black Northeastern Federation of Clubs applied for membership in the NAWSA as late as 1919, just one year before victory, the leadership's response was a repeat of Susan B. Anthony's rejection of Black women suffragists a quarter century earlier. Informing the Federation that its application could not be considered, the NAWSA leader explained that if the news is flashed throughout the southern state at this most critical moment that the National American Association has just admitted an organization of 6,000 colored women, the enemies can cease from further effort. The defeat of the amendment will be assured. Still, Black women supported the battle for suffrage until the very end. Unlike their white sisters, black women suffragists enjoyed the support of many of their men. Just as a black man, Frederick Douglass, had been the most outstanding male advocate of women's equality during the 19th century, so W.E.B. Du Bois emerged as the leading male advocate of women's suffrage in the 20th century. In a satirical article on the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, Du Bois described the white men who hurled jeers as well as physical blows, and over 100 people were injured, as the upholders of the glorious traditions of Anglo-Saxon manhood. Wasn't it glorious? Does it not make you burn with shame to be a mere black man when such mighty deeds are done by the leaders of civilization? Does it not make you ashamed of your race? Does it not make you want to be white? Concluding the article on a serious note, Du Bois quotes one of the white women marchers who said that black men had been unanimously respectful. Of the thousands watching the parade, not one of them was boisterous or rude. The difference between them and those insolent, bold white men was remarkable. This parade, whose male spectators were black, was rigidly segregated by its white women organizers. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Little mistake. was rigidly segregated by its white women organizers. They even instructed Ida B. Wells to leave the Illinois contingent and to march with the segregated black group in deference to the white women from the South. The request was made publicly during the rehearsal of the Illinois contingent, and while Mrs. Barnett, Ida Wells, glanced about the room looking for support, the ladies debated the question of principle versus expediency, most of them evidently feeling that they must not prejudice Southerners against suffrage. Ida B. Wells was not one to follow racist instructions, however and at parade time, she slipped into the Illinois section. As a male advocate of women's suffrage, W.E.B. Du Bois was peerless among black and white men alike. His militancy, his eloquence, and the principled character of his numerous appeals caused many of his contemporaries to view him as the most outstanding male defender of women's political equality of his time. Du Bois's appeals were impressive not only for their lucidity and persuasiveness, but also for their relative lack of male supremacist undertones. In his speeches and writings, he welcomed the expanding leadership roles played by black women. 
who are moving quietly and forcibly toward the intellectual leadership of the race. While some men would have interpreted this rising power of women as a definite cause for alarm, W.A.B. Du Bois argued that, on the contrary, this situation created a special urgency for extending the ballot to black women. The enfranchisement of these women will not be a mere doubling of our vote and voice in the nation, but will lead to a stronger and more normal political life. In 1915, an article entitled Votes for Women, a symposium by leading thinkers in colored America, was published by Du Bois in The Crisis. It was the transcript of a forum whose participants included judges, ministers, university professors, elected officials, church leaders, and educators. Charles W. Chesnut, Reverend Francis J. Grimke, Benjamin Brawley, and the Honorable Robert H. Terrell were some of the many male advocates of women's suffrage who spoke during this symposium. The women included Mary Church Terrell, Anna Jones, and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. The vast majority of the women who participated in the Forum on Women's Suffrage were affiliated with the National Association of Colored Women. In their statements, there were surprisingly few invocations of the popular argument among white suffragists that women's special nature, their domesticity, and their innate morality gave them a special claim to the vote. There was one glaring exception, however. Nanny H. Burroughs, educator and church leader, carried the womanly morality thesis so far as to imply the absolute superiority of black women over their men. Women needed the vote, Burroughs insisted, because their men had bartered and sold this valuable weapon. The Negro woman needs the ballot to get back by the wise use of it what the Negro man has lost by the misuse of it. She needs it to ransom her race. A comparison with the men of her race in moral issues is odious. She carries the burdens of the church and of the school and bears a great deal more than her economic share in the home. Of the dozen or so women participants, Burroughs alone assumed a position which rested on the convoluted argument that women were morally superior, implying, of course, that they were inferior to men in most other respects. Mary Church Terrell spoke on women's suffrage in the 15th Amendment, Anna Jones on women's suffrage and social reform, and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin described her own historical experiences in the women's suffrage campaign. Others focused their remarks on working women, education, children, and club life. In concluding her remarks on women and colored women, Mary Talbert summed up the admiration for black women expressed throughout the symposium. By her peculiar position, the colored woman has gained clear powers of observation and judgment, exactly the sort of powers which are today peculiarly necessary to the building of an ideal country. Black women had been more than willing to contribute those clear powers of observation and judgment toward the creation of a multiracial movement for women's political rights. But at every turn they were betrayed, spurned, and rejected by the leaders of the Lily White women's suffrage movement. For suffragists and club women alike, black women were simply expendable entities when it came time to woo Southern support with a white complexion. As for the women's suffrage camp, it appears that all those concessions to Southern women made very little difference in the end. When the votes on the 19th Amendment were tallied, the Southern states were still lined up in the opposition camp, and in fact almost managed to defeat the amendment. After the long-awaited victory of women's suffrage, black women in the South were violently prevented from exercising their newly acquired right. The eruption of Ku Klux Klan violence in places like Orange County, Florida, brought injury and death to black women and their children. In other places, there were more peaceably, 
<laughs> Just like one paragraph left here. <laughs> In other places, they were more peacefully prohibited from exercising their new right. In Americus, Georgia, for instance, more than 250 colored women went to the polls to vote but were turned down or their ballots refused to be taken by the election manager. In the ranks of the movement, which had so fervently fought for the enfranchisement of women, there was hardly a cry of protest to be heard. All right, that's it. That's chapter nine of Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. So hopefully we'll see some folks out at the Social Justice Center, 4.30 p.m. this Sunday. And we can have a little discussion about that reading. Okay, y'all. Uh, YouTube folks, thanks for watching. Appreciate you. Um, check out my TikTok if you're on there. Or get on there. <laughs> and Twitter folks, thanks a lot.